Nope, oh, thank you for catching that. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily mean it. It was wrong on something else, but I'll fix that. Thank you. Okay, so what is the correct answer? Um, Why are we hesitating? This should be an easy one. B, C, or D. B, C, or D. All right, well, B and D are the same, so it's B or C. So let's see, what do we have? We all know that 2 is correct. Are we okay with 2? All right, so then what about three? Congress can appoint officers of the United States under the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution. What did I say in class? No. Absolutely not, right? That was the argument that was made. That's one of the class tests right there. You fell for it. All right, and so four, we're willing to accept. President and Congress can appoint inferior, inferior officers under the Constitution. Oh, six. I was going to say that's not right. Um, okay. Congress has the power to appoint inferior officers directly. Is that right? Is that right? No. That was the other issue I was testing. If you look at the Constitution, it gives Congress the power to delegate. Congress cannot directly appoint inferior officers. So again, I was testing on something that was specifically talked about only in class. You would have had to have been in class to have gotten that correct or read the Constitution. Either one would have worked. So what is the correct answer? A. So don't let it fool you if for some reason I have two of the same things on the exam. It doesn't mean they're right as they were not right there. All right. Well, it's going to be wrong because appointment, technically, you don't need the Senate's approval. Nomination, you need the Senate's approval. The no, the, the president nominates its. Um, nomination implies Senate approval. You nominate a Supreme Court justice, but you appoint other people. If, the, if for agency heads, for example, the Senate, the Senate has to approve. So, for example, for the um, Attorney General's position. The president would nominate somebody, but then that person would only be appointed with the, the advice and consent of the Senate, is how it works. That's true of the Supreme Court as well. Those are the officers of the United States, sort of the senior positions. We don't really know how, I don't really know how deep that goes into an agency, but all the secretary heads, for example, have to be approved with, with the Senate. So the, the president would nominate, and it would be confirmed, the position would be confirmed. So the president can't appoint without the Senate confirmation. Inferior officers, the president, um, now the inferior officers, Congress delegates who appoints, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's nobody that the president, let me think about that. The, let's pull it up and look at it. Anybody, I don't know if I, this doesn't have a constitution in it. Somebody got the clause in front of them? I'll pull it up. Anybody have their book with them? All right, I, I could take a while and look through my notes, but it might take longer. Yeah, you want to show that over? I'd get up, but I can't look. Thank you, sir. All right, where is it in here? Administrative Procedure Act. We get the Constitution. Article what? <laughs> One. <laughs> I've got the Constitution right here. Article one. Article one. Come on, not Article 2, Section 2. The President shall have the power, with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties. He shall nominate, and by with the advice and consent of the, consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, public ministers, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers, capital O, of the United States. 
whose appointments are not otherwise provided for. Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of the departments. So it's, if the president has power to appoint alone, it has come from Congress delegating the power. Usually, I believe Congress does delegate the power to appoint the executive branch, um, the, the, the inferior officers. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Question nine, did we do it yet? The armadillo law. Oh yeah, we're back to ex parte again. This one should be pretty easy. What's the answer? We already talked about ex parte. Mm -hmm. She is correct. The enabling statute, the APA never requires um, docketing, really. The, a the APA requires that all information be put in the record. Docketing is kind of a term of art that comes through usually in, in a statute, enabling statute. Um, this, I believe, was informal notice and comment, notice of proposed regulation, so there would be no prohibition against ex parte. Yes, Ms. Miller? Um, why would a conversation between a CEO and a madman be docketed at all? Who the hell is Dr. Evil? Dr. Evil, I believe, was it taken out? He was supposed to be, maybe I took Dr. that out by mistake. He was supposed to be the secretary of the Fish and Wildlife Service. I took that out, didn't I? Okay, but since he's... If he was the secretary, then it's C. But if he's not, then I mean that. Would well, be they, what yeah, it's that, if I, I edited the question. They originally had him as a low-level attorney, and I had mm -hmm. to change that because there may be different rules that apply to attorneys or whatever. So, like I said, sometimes you write things in questions you're not realizing. I took it to the head of the agency, um, but then I remember I deleted the first line, and that's where I had it in there. So that's why it's confusing to you. So he is the secretary. He is the secretary. So that would have to be fixed. Yep, thanks for pointing out the error. So because he's the secretary then. And that's the kind of stuff, by the way, if for some reason you see that in one of the questions that I write, I need to know that. I would have thrown that question out if you had told, come to me after the fact and said that was unclear. Um, hopefully you would have realized that it was supposed to be in there, but you'd think because it said ex parte communication that something was missing. So that's the kind of stuff if you see, please let me know because I will throw questions out if they're just blatantly unfair. That, uh, that's not my intent um, to trick you by not putting factual information in the question. Okay, 10. So this is getting at that reliance issue that we talked about. What's the correct answer? This one I think was a little tricky. That's why I rewrote it slightly. It was actually probably in terms of needing the least amount of work. It was the best question in that regard. I only rewrote the correct answer just slightly to make it clearer. Correct answer? You guys need to be quiet since it's your question. Correct answer? 
All right, well, let's think about it. Reliance, what's the general, can you generally get reliance uh, damages from the government? No. So you know the answer is probably no. It's probably going to fail, and you've got three fails. So let's see if any of those make sense. Fail because an estoppel claim against the government will only prevail when the advice relied upon came from a high-level agency employee. Did we talk about it had to be a high-level employee? No, no, that's a, that's a distractor because you're like, that sounds like it makes sense. <laughs> that's why it's a good distractor. No, we never talked about that issue. It has nothing to do with it, all right? Two, fail because INW's reliance on the advice of the BLM official was unreasonable. Now, we know that reasonableness is one of the elements of a claim for reliance uh, damages, right, for estoppel. So. You need to go back and look at the facts. Does it seem reasonable to rely on somebody telling them, yeah, those coordinates sound, sound correct? Yes. It seems mm -hmm. pretty reasonable. So uh, it, probably that's incorrect. All right? C, fail because INW cannot show it suffered any detriment because it should never have received the profits in the first place. Sounds right. Sounds that's right? Good. That is right. That's why. Because remember the one where the guy was getting the uh, disability benefits and it turned out he was getting all this extra money and the governor's like, you can't, just because just you've got all that extra money and you used it for three years, now you have to give it back, you know, you're not really harmed. Same thing here, they were cutting down trees they weren't entitled to have the profits to. So the language I added to this, when the first time around I just said fail because INW cannot show that it suffered any detriment, period. And that one even caught me when I went through it. I was like, well, no, they're harmed. And I kept going, and I couldn't find a correct answer. And then I came back and looked at that, and I'm like, oh, yes, of course, that's right, because they shouldn't have taken the trees. So I added in the because it should never receive the profits in the first place. So read, you know, read your answers there pretty, pretty carefully. Um, I try to put the, the test in the, in the answer to the question. OK, so that takes us to our last one on this um, section, this piece. Spell your last name. M C. Okay, and let me also point out, I tend to not like the not questions. Um, so I use very few of them, or I try to. I just think they're confusing in general. Um, but with that said, let's see if we can figure this one out. So this is a, um, what do you call it, a um, track factors test. Mm -hmm. So what is it that the court, which of these elements is the court not consider. Should be relatively easy. <laughs> What's the answer, guys? D is correct. D is, D is the, 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 the not D is not considered the reasonableness of the ensuing decision. There may not be an ensuing decision, right? Um, but the other ones are all there. And that was Mr. Knox and Mr. Williams, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I have two different names on that one, I think, because I deleted whatever question came before it from somebody else. And I didn't delete the bubble there. Okay. So um, those questions, if you notice, there was an awful lot on due process, ex parte seem to be the common themes on that one. I think this class probably had different common themes. We still have some time. Is this helpful to you? You want to keep going? OK. Let's read about Frank Chester, the molester. This one, by the way, is very long, and I typically wouldn't do one that's that long.
today. Long question with long answers. Um, you guys ready? Okay, now we talked a little bit more about exhaustion in last year's class than we did um, this year, talked about it a little bit differently. So that question would have been easier, I think, for that class than it would be for you. Did anybody come up with a possible answer? C. That's what I put. C. It could be wrong, but that's the, the, yeah. <laughs> It is wrong because of the last sentence there. It has been held that the common law exceptions to the exhaustion doctrine apply to claims brought under the APA. So uh, we don't know whether they will or whether they won't. And what I went into with last year's class is I think most likely that would be a violation for my Yankee. So that's why D would be probably correct there. Um, but again, that would have been a last year's class topic. Um, getting to something specifically that we discussed in last year's class is different than what we talked this year. Believe it or not, I'm not a robot. I don't do everything the same every year. But what's important here is a couple things. We haven't really talked about this. Under the APA, only under the APA, exhaustion is generally not required unless what? Two things. Statute requires, Statute requires it or? Regulation with a stay. A regulation with a stay, right. And notice that question, the answer B, only has half of that in there. Plaintiff need not exhaust available administrative remedies before seeking judicial review unless the agency's regulations specifically mandate exhaustion as a prerequisite to judicial review. That would be wrong because it doesn't say they not only do they require it, but they also provide a stay or a statute does. So watch for those kinds of things. Um, okay, question two. The correct answer is C. C is correct. And this was actually one I used last year because it tested on the arbitrary and capricious standard. And again, notice that the arbitrary and capricious standard is written right into the answer. I can't really say it is arbitrary and capricious because that's too hard on a multiple choice. You know, all of, all of what we do as lawyers is give you issues that can go pretty much either way. So usually you're going to see the test um, in the answer and the point is getting the test correctly and here rational connection between the facts found and the choice made. Also testing on the idea that it's remanded to the agency. It's not just voided, it's remanded back to the agency um, for further consideration. So, okay, question three.
Freedom of Information Act, the exceptions. Um, this was actually one I had to rewrite the entire question. D? D is correct. Yeah, the only one that um, is not an exception is six. <laughs> And you know the trick on those, right? When you're reading through the Roman numeral ones, cross off the ones that aren't relevant. Don't try to remember them in your head. I know that sounds like a stupid thing to help you with, but test taking can be challenging, so I want to make sure you do well on the test taking, and it's all on your substantive knowledge. Question four. I said B. Correct answer for Tinkerbell. B. What's that? I said B. B. That's correct. That was getting at the issue that yes, you, you have, when you have criminal ones there, you do have the right to have an attorney present, or at least be able to advise you, but not necessarily to cross-examine. As I'm reading this, by the way, and I'm just trying to get you used to my thought process, C is close enough um, because really, in some ways, C and B say the same thing, that I would find that C would need to be rewritten a little bit. So if you said C, you shouldn't feel bad. They're, they're, they're so close that that would be confusing. OK, question five. Painter shepherding Thors. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but that's why the word public was definitely put into the question. And I think they had not put it in there, if I recall. Okay, so what's the answer for question five? Uh, B. I said B. Possibly A. Um, <laughs> B, possibly A. Maybe C. Not E. Not E. Yeah, you has got to be wrong. I've just read the first, Alaska Professional Hunters is, as we talked about, not, probably not good law. All right, the, the answer is C. Dang it. 
And that, remember, if you remember, that is the um, Brand X case, right? Did we cover Brand X this year? Yes. Okay. I know we covered the stat law, but did we cover it? Sorry. Did we cover it? No. 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 Not really. Okay, well then, um, and that's what it was testing on, is basically that issue, which is, must have been something I covered with them that I didn't cover with you guys. I remember covered it, covering it in stat law this year. But anyway, the answer is, um, is C. If a court interprets a statute under the first section of Chevron, then the agencies can't change the interpretation. If it's under the second step of Chevron, uh, then the agencies can. That's the short and sweet. Okay, question six. This one should be pretty easy. What's the answer? A. A, yes. Keep going. Oh, oops. No. <laughs> oh, it's no. <laughs> so, what's the rule on associational standing? Associations can bring standing when what? You have a member that has standing. Member has standing. And it forwards the purpose of the organization. And? No money damages. You don't need their participation. Okay, no money damages. Don't need the individual's participation. Look at the question facts. Oh. Okay, there you go. You guys went right over that because you were reading fast, right? This is a great lesson. This is called why the bar exam and all multiple choice questions and all exams for that matter are a test on reading comprehension. You went right over it because you didn't expect to see it. Now, again, I didn't write this question. It's unlikely that I'm going to pick, be that particularly picky about something, particularly given that we don't spend a whole lot of time analyzing that particular issue. But this is why I'm saying to you, you need to read the question slowly. And if you're not sure, this is an exam technique I always tell students taking the bar. Um, circle it, put down an answer for now, but come back to it. Just come back to the ones that you're unclear on. Don't ever go back and redo your entire exam. You'll change correct answers into wrong answers. The evidence is pretty clear on that. But sometimes if you go back and read a question like that a second time, that fact that you missed the first time through will jump out at you. Now, um, in terms of otherwise, if that issue weren't in there, we would have, I think we would still have problems with Bloomoff and Salmons. I don't know if I changed the facts around. My, my recollection was they had never been to the park and had no intentions, no immediate plans to go back. So B would be the second correct answer if we didn't have the money issue. Aesthetic injury is enough to establish standing? I believe so. Aesthetic injury is enough. The only one that's not enough is uh, alone is procedural. And under prudential standing requirements, generally third parties cannot sue, but the exception to that is associational standing. So, all right, question seven. Answer was sorry. Oh, C. What about B? B would have been correct if it hadn't been seeking monetary damages. All the professors are being plaintiffs. That's what threw me. Yeah. Oh, well, she alone can seek monetary damages. So well, yeah, I see your point. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, again, writing in a, an issue. The, the point was whether the association could bring suit. So it's not as clear as it could have been. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, question seven. I didn't use this one last year, but it's making me laugh.
should have this one down pat now. What's the answer? C is correct. Yep. See how easy that's getting? You guys are going to have ex parte down. Let's hope there's actually a question on it. Yeah. Okay, question eight. Oh, I like this one. 